Hello and good morning, everybody. Welcome to my lecture in the Monday Morning Introduction to Philosophy and Theory lecture series. Today, we're going to be talking about the proficiency gap and how you can overcome it. Welcome to everybody joining us on Instagram as well as on YouTube. Um, I've recently been spending more time on my YouTube, and I hope that you've enjoyed that. I certainly enjoyed hearing from you guys in the comment section. So hello, YouTube, I see you, and hello, Instagram, below. If you are joining for the very first time, welcome to our global learning community in which each and every Monday morning we start the week off in intellectual fashion with philosophy and theory ideas brought directly from me to you. This is supposed to be an introductory session, so it is designed for beginners. You don't have to have any previous knowledge of philosophy or theory. And my goal is simply to start the week in a philosophical fashion that we can share ideas together. And usually this is part of a lecture series. So this is actually the beginning of a new series that we started last week called The Life of the Mind. And in The Life of the Mind, we talk about the topic of self-reflection and the theme of the discovery of the self within Western philosophy. Now, last week we covered the idea of theory and practice. And today we're gonna to continue on that narrative arc and we're gonna be talking about the proficiency gap and how you can overcome it. But first, as you guys know, the absolute best thing that you could possibly do for me is let me know where you're joining me from. I always love seeing that in the comments. Um, that, is, that is literally the thing I enjoy the most about this. So I already see somebody from New York City, shout out to New York City. Um, I'm curious where you guys are joining us from. Please do drop a comment. I see Philippines, greetings to the Philippines. Philippines was actually one of the first countries where we had a lot of students. Brooklyn, Brooklyn represent, hello, I see you. South Africa, India, Los Angeles, another student from the Philippines, greetings. Kurdistan, Iraq, that's amazing, hello, good morning. Portugal, hello, I see you. Morocco, uh, Kurdistan, Oxford, I actually used to teach in Oxford. Um, Lima, Peru, that, that's amazing. Slovakia, the Netherlands, Huia Morcha, Kent, Ohio. South Africa, that is amazing. Another person from the Netherlands, from Breda, that's impressive. Israel, that's beautiful. Thank you guys so, so much. I see Miami, I see Mexico City. I could spend an entire hour just doing shout outs and call outs to people. Turkey, Merhaba, um, this is so beautiful. This, this is really, it means a lot to me. Thank you guys so much. Um, and before we begin the lecture, I should also say a huge, massive thank you to our patrons who continue to fund this, pro this project with actual money. Thank you to all of our patrons who allow me to keep doing this every single week, both our patrons on YouTube and our patrons on Instagram. Um, and if you're curious about becoming a patron and supporting this project, basically as a patron, you get access to my ebook subscription service where every three months I publish an ebook that corresponds to the lecture series that we've just taught. For example, right now you have two more weeks to download the book from the previous lecture series, um, and then that will disappear. It's called The Useless Precaution. You can also download edited transcripts for each and every one of these lectures. Every single audio for every single lecture I recorded, that's more than 100 hours of educational content you can download as a podcast. And of course, this is like the best part for me, the Q&A podcast that we record after each and every lecture, where we spend another hour talking with you guys and discussing what we've just talked about in the class. So if you'd like to download all of that exclusive data, files, whatever, please go to www.patreon.com forward slash Jeneline and Julian. I'll say it one more time, but it's also in the link in bio. That's www, for everybody on YouTube, www.patreon.com forward slash Jeneline and Julian. Okay, I think that we're about ready to begin. I hope that you are comfortable. Thank you so much for starting your Monday morning with me. Um, this is gonna be a 50 minute lecture, an introductory lecture in which we talk about the proficiency gap and how that relates to philosophy and theory. Along the way, we're gonna learn about Hegel, we're gonna learn about Zizek, we're gonna learn about Schlegel, which is an actual name, I didn't just make that up. So make yourself comfortable. All right, so I want to start with this idea of the proficiency gap. And the proficiency gap is an idea that's very important to me. Um, I think it runs through pretty much everything that I do. And if you want a very basic definition of the proficiency gap, it's the gap 
between what you would like to be able to do and what you are in fact capable of doing. Now, usually when you start a project, whether it's learning a language or starting a YouTube channel or really anything you do in life, you have a certain idea of how you would like to do it. You've seen other people do it well. It's like you want to become a filmmaker because you love cinema. You want to become a writer because you love reading. You want to become an athlete because you idolize other athletes. We start with inspiration. That is how we want to make something. That's how we want to make something of ourselves. And yet one of the painful realizations in life is that we know what excellence looks like, and yet we feel so far removed from it. And there's no shortcut, right? You can't just say, I want to be really good at speaking French. Unless you were born in France, you're going to have to learn how to speak it, which means you're going to have to go through a lengthy period of not speaking it well. Of course, this is a truism. The only way to learn something is by doing it repeatedly, which means that you have to start in a manner that is not perfect, and then you slowly hone it until it becomes better. And if you will, this idea of the proficiency gap, namely the gap between what you are currently capable of doing and that which you would like to someday be able to do, has everything to do with one of the age-old philosophical problems namely the problem of theory and practice. Because if you think about it, the proficiency gap is simply an awareness that something may seem easy in theory and yet is very difficult in practice. That you could say to yourself, I would like to become a great writer or a great artist, a great painter, or a great thinker. And yet you realize that what appeared easy to you actually contains a huge lifelong process of learning and development. In other words, you simply do not yet have the skills. And this is an idea that I originally took from Ira Glass, who is the producer and host of a radio show called This American Life. And Ira Glass in one of his shows said that there was one idea that he wished that somebody would have told him when he was younger. And he refers to it in terms of taste. He says, everybody wants to create something. Everybody wants to make something usually have a pretty good sense of taste, right? Let's say you want to be a filmmaker. Like I said before, you have pretty good taste in movies. You take an interest in movies. Let's say you want to be a writer. You take a pretty good, you have taste when it comes to literature. Let's say that you want to be an athlete. Clearly, you know a lot about the sport that you love. If you want to become something, if you want to become good at it, it usually implies that you know quite a lot about it to begin with. Otherwise, you wouldn't even be trying. And yet, this taste that you have, this awareness and this knowledge, is precisely the barrier that you have to overcome. That is the hurdle. Because if you have sufficient knowledge and taste to want to imitate something, then it also means that you have sufficient understanding and awareness to know that basically you suck. That when you start doing something, you're simply not there yet. You're not good enough yet at that point. And I think that this is where a lot of people stop in their tracks. This is where a lot of people start. Namely, I'm going to be this great writer, this great thinker, this great painter, this great skateboarder, this great whatever. Fill in the blank. And then you realize, oh man, this is going to be hard. This is actually a lot harder than I thought it was. And this is the fundamental part where you have to decide whether or not you are actually capable of seeing it through. And it's okay if you don't. Like a lot of people start studying something and then they realize one semester in that they can't possibly imagine spending the rest of their life learning about this topic. And often it's something that they really love. You go into history and you think, I love history. And then you realize, I love history, but these courses are actually killing my love of history. Which is totally fine because then you switch into another major and then you're doing something that you actually feel like it gives you a skill. Many people who love poetry and literature will study engineering because they'd like to work as an engineer and enjoy poetry as a hobby. Just because you love something doesn't mean that you have to become it. This is a very important insight. Like, just because you love watching baseball doesn't mean you have to become a baseball player. Just because you're really interested in something and you appreciate doesn't mean that you have to be able to replicate it. I'll give you an example from my own life. I spend almost every waking minute of my day listening to music. I have great admiration for musicians. And yet, I fundamentally know about myself that I am not musically gifted, that I cannot hold a note, and that no matter how hard I would work at it, I might be able to 
barely become proficient. And that's okay, because learning your own limitations is part of learning what it is that you can do well. And so when it comes to the idea of the proficiency gap, it's basically saying there is a gap between what you can do and what you would like to do. And that, in a sense, you have to realize that you start and you suck. And that's a good thing because it means that you can actually enjoy the process of slowly and incrementally becoming better, finding mentors and teachers who can help you reach the point in which you live up to your own standards. And this is one of those funny things because that's when you start realizing that even though you may have gifts and talents that you can further hone, that hard work is going to beat talent. That all that success is in any field is simply applying yourself rigorously to doing something poorly until you do it well. And that when it comes to reading or studying philosophy, when it comes to having a good relationship, when it comes to really literally anything in life, you have to apply yourself to it, which means doing things wrong in order to learn from your mistakes. Now, so far so obvious, you might think, right? Nobody starts out being able to play a Beethoven piano concert without having to go through painstaking, tortuous, decade-long practice sessions. And yet, I truly believe, and I really want you to hear this, I truly believe that everybody in their life has something that they love enough that they want to become good at it. That this can be different for everybody. Something that you find enjoyable, I might find to be a total drag. And yet, whether it's mountain climbing, whether it's becoming a welder, whether it's becoming an engineer, whether it's becoming a philosopher, there is something that you find uniquely satisfying because it's hard. And that I really truly believe that once you find this thing, that the thing that you enjoy because it's hard, that's where contentment and satisfaction lies. And so I wanna start on that note because I think it's an important note that we realize that a lot of these philosophical debates, for example, the debate about the difference between theory and practice, are actually applicable to things that we experience in our life which is that it's very easy to want to do something in theory and it is ever so hard to have to implement it in practice. And then finding the thing that you enjoy doing poorly until you do it well is precisely what it means to have found a commitment, a vocation, something that is unique to you, that you could do every single day, you could wake up and want to get better at that thing even though you're so far removed from actually living up to your own standards. It's like an athlete like LeBron James in the NBA will say, I don't compete with other people, I compete with myself. Once you find something where you enjoy competing with yourself and you're not just comparing yourself to others, that's where happiness lies. That's where true satisfaction and contentment and ultimately freedom lies. And what we're gonna do today in this class is we're gonna take this idea of the proficiency gap and we're gonna flesh it out and give it some philosophical meat, if you will kind of make it a little bit more complex. But I think on a basic level, everybody can understand the idea of wanting to do something really well and yet realizing that you're so far removed from it. I used to want to draw comics and I would draw a comic and I would just be imitating what other people had drawn. And then I tried to create my own comic and I realized that my comic sucked. Like if somebody said, oh wow, that's beautiful. You have so much talent, this is hilarious. I would pity them because I knew that they were simply saying it to humor me that it wasn't a truthful reflection because I knew objectively that my work was bad. And it's so important that when you have this moment where you realize that your work is not good, that you don't take that as the end. You don't say, okay, my work is bad and now I'm gonna stop working on it. Instead, it's the other way around. You say, okay, my work is bad, which is precisely why I wanna make it better. And that's when you realize that one of the curses, one of the difficulties of doing anything really well is that even if you succeeded, you're always gonna stand at a remove from it. Peter Jackson, the legendary filmmaker of the Lord of the Rings trilogy and somewhat less legendary, the Hobbit series, said that if he could be granted one wish, it would be to be able to watch the Lord of the Rings without being Peter Jackson. And this is like, there's almost like a, a spiritual curse here, isn't it? Which is that the gods will give you the power to make something extraordinary and yet the one person who can't really enjoy it is the person who makes it. You cannot inhabit your own success. You're the one who realizes that it wasn't easy. It didn't happen overnight. It's like if you've written a book and you open the book, all you'll see are things that you would have said differently. If you've made a movie and everybody loves it, 
all you're gonna see is all the shots that you wish you could refilm. And so part of the burden of being a successful creator is that you will never be able to enjoy it objectively in the way other people can. But that's also the only reason why you were able to make something that other people would love, because you were the person who every single day were able to be ruthlessly critical about that which you, which you were trying to create. And so when Peter Jackson says that the one wish that he wished he could be granted is not being Peter Jackson, he's essentially saying, I wish that somebody would have made The Lord of the Rings so that I could enjoy it as much as I would have if I hadn't made it myself. And so it's really important to understand this, that like the same is true for fame. If you become famous or successful, you don't inhabit it. There's no point at which you feel famous. Because what is fame? Fame is simply being recognized by a lot of other people and hopefully admired by those people. People have strong parasocial connections to the work that you've done. You've starred in a movie or you're the chef in a cooking show. And yet you will never be that person to yourself. In fact, that would be the fundamental error that you could make, which is to say, I really believe my own hype. And that is one of the problems of being alive, and yet I believe also the key to what it means to have a healthy existence, which is that we don't inhabit our own being directly. We don't fully enjoy our own successes. We cannot stand back and objectively enjoy that which we've been able to create. Instead, we're obsessed with everything we weren't able to do. We take criticism much more easily than we take praise. And that's precisely why it's so important that if you want to overcome the proficiency gap, namely you want to actually be able to do something that lives up to your own standards, you start enjoying the process of failing better every day, of every single day working and honing on the thing that you know objectively is not great yet, and that could become so much better. Okay, so now we're going to try to like flesh out this idea with some philosophical thoughts. And ultimately, in, at the end of the next 40 minutes, arrive at a pretty difficult technical idea. So Aristotle has this notion, um, which you may have heard before. Aristotle says that essentially every human being is like an acorn. And that the acorn, if it thrives, if it finds itself in the right environment, will be able to grow into a magnificent oak tree. Now, on the one hand, we have here what is essentially a avant la lettre pregenitor idea to a self-help principle you've probably seen on the internet, which is cut toxic people out of your life, create a good environment, and you will thrive. That within each and every one of us, there lies an acorn and that we have to grow it, that we have to nurture it into a great and strong tree. This is not untrue. Of course, you have to create an environment in which you can thrive. This is one of the first principles of education is to say, you have to find a place where you can actually educate yourself, where you can focus, where you can read. The whole point of creating, for example, a university originally, if you go all the way back to the idea of Plato's Academy, was to create a space where people could simply think. Because consider this for a moment. When you're thinking, you're making yourself vulnerable. Thinking is the opposite of action. I mean, you could play tennis and listen to a podcast at the same time. I'm not disputing this. And yet the idea of being in deep thought, of working on yourself, requires study. And Having a space in which you can do this without making yourself vulnerable is at the heart of the idea of the academy. If you go back to the idea of the Platonic Academy, the notion was simply where do we create a space where young men, because at the time it was segregated, where young men can simply do nothing for a long period of time. It's a radical proposition, which is to say, let's create a space where the whole point is that you come here and you do nothing. If you think about the whole promise and the luxury of what a, an education is, it's the luxury of going somewhere where for a couple of years, everybody's gonna ask you one really annoying question, which is, what are you gonna do next? It's actually like, a lot of students hate this question. You go to a party or you go to a family gathering and people say, what are you gonna do with your degree? What are you gonna do next? And, and students resent that question because it's a lot of pressure, understandably. And yet if you think about it the other way around, it's a beautiful opportunity, which is that there's a moment in your life where people expect you to grow. They expect you to thrive. They say, okay, you're at university. I wanna know what you do next. And since they're optimistic, they're curious about what you're gonna make of yourself. Now, if you're working a job, it's quite rare that somebody's gonna walk up to you and say, hey, what are you gonna do next? Whereas when you're in, uni in a university, you've created this intellectual environment where it's expected of you that you will grow out of it, that you will someday enter the so-called real world. And unless, of course, you become an academic. Um, 
So this idea that Aristotle has, which is that everybody is an acorn, and that if you create the right nurturing environment for it, the acorn will grow into a magnificent oak tree. Here we have an idea that is actually fundamentally the opposite of what Plato would believe. Now, if you want to understand the history of Western philosophy, a really good starting point is to understand some of the differences between Aristotle and Plato. However, it's important to note that when I say Plato, I really mean Socrates. One of the things that Plato did was to systematize Socrates' body of work into a platonic idealist system. Now, it's fair to note that we don't necessarily know if this would have been Socrates' true intent. It's very likely that Plato essentially used Socrates as a mouthpiece for his own ideas, Plato being a student of Socrates. And yet there's some fundamental principles that are true within platonic idealism apropos the idea of Aristotelian virtue. And we can break it down very simply. Keep in mind this simplification. For Aristotle, the idea is that you contain within yourself an acorn, that you grow into a tree. Now, so far this seems like a pretty easy figurative metaphor. You start with something that has potential, and over time, if you nurture it, if you take care of it, if you put it into the right environment, it will grow into its natural form. And everybody who has ever done anything, like, doesn't have to be gardening, will understand this metaphor, which is that you, in a sense, as a human being, are pure potential. And your life is the process of reaching or optimizing, maximizing that potential. And that is the beauty of what it means to be alive, is that we have the subjective agency of wanting to invest in our own growth. That is the Aristotelian idea. Now, if we break that down into a more philosophical analysis, essentially what Aristotle is arguing is that your true nature thereby lies in the tree. And that what you are, the acorn, the seed, contains a blueprint for the tree. And here we have a very beautiful idea. Of course, we can question it from a platonic standpoint, but we have a beautiful idea, which is that everything that you need in order to become your best self, your true self, thereby lies within the kernel. That the process of becoming is simply the process of creating the right environment for you to reach your natural state. And what's interesting about this, again, from a philosophical perspective, is that Aristotle is essentially saying that you are predetermined to some extent, that everybody has the tree in them, that it is up to you to create an environment by which you become the tree. Of course, here we can already detect the very beginnings of a more conservative and perhaps even reactionary argument, which is that what if you don't become the tree? What if you fail to become a healthy giant oak tree? Who is to blame? For Aristotle, the environment is to blame. For Aristotle, you will innately become the tree as long as you have the right environment, which means that if you don't become a magnificent oak tree, then either it is your fault or it is somebody else's fault. The trajectory of your destiny has somehow been disrupted. At least, if you think about it, that is the teleological premise within Aristotle. Now let me stop for a moment here and very briefly explain one of the key like jargon laden, one of the key jargons, pieces of jargon in philosophy. That seems very difficult, but like once you understand it, it's pretty easy. That's the difference between ontology and teleology. Now, there's an easy way to explain that and a hard way to explain that. The easy way to explain it is that ontology is an analysis or a question of what something is. Teleology, on the other hand, is a, an analysis of what something purpose is. In other words, what is something and what is its purpose? Let's say that you um, were an alien and you came to Earth and you saw a fork and the fork was taken out of context. Your first analysis would be to say, what is this? You would, I don't know, bite it. If you're an alien with teeth, you would knock it around. You would analyze what it's made of. Is it made of aluminum or steel or plastic? Then you would start asking yourself, what is the point of it? What is its purpose? In other words, what is it used for? And by asking this question, what is it used for? You can probably deduct that because it is a relatively hard, uh, it is relatively hard and that it has prongs that probably it's meant to be used to put something on, like to spike it. I'm not being very eloquent. You know what a fork is. Then the question is, well, is it a weapon? Yes or no? Technically, the fork could be a weapon, but it's not sharp enough. And then you could further deduct at a certain point that 
forks are in fact for eating. It's a utensil, a tool that we use to spike food onto a fork and put it in our mouth. Now, this lengthy di diversion was simply to say that when we look at the fork, there's a difference between what it is, namely a slightly odd-shaped, pronged object, versus what its purpose is. Here, of course, we can understand that the purpose overdetermines the nature of its being, which is a fancy way of saying that there's a problem that we're trying to solve. The problem is we want to eat food more effectively. Now, those of you who live in the Asian world will immediately know that chopsticks may be a more efficient solution to this problem, and yet in much of the Western world, the fork was the solution. And so we have a solution to the problem, which is how to more efficiently eat without using our hands. And so we create the fork. The fork thereby delivers food more efficiently to our mouth. It is part of the civilizing process, if you will. Here we have performed in its very basic form, sorry, the difference between ontology and teleology, namely what something is and what something is for. What is its purpose? And we can get to forks in a moment because there's a very interesting history of forks and like the way in which forks influence Western civilization. But we can talk about that in the Q&A in the podcast. For Aristotle, the relationship between what something is and what something's purpose is, namely the relationship between ontology and teleology, is essentially a linear development. You are something to begin with, and your purpose is to reach your full potential. In other words, your purpose is to reach your true nature. Let's say that you have a blob of aluminum and the purpose of that aluminum is to become a fork. That is essentially Aristotle's argument, that, our, that a priori there is something within the DNA of, of being that has to emerge in its becoming. I just saw someone say, can you record this live? I am recording this live right now and I'm posting it to my Patreon. That's www.patreon.com forward slash Jenaline and Julian, but I'm also saving it and posting it for free to my Instagram and YouTube. Hello, YouTube. Thank you for still being here. Okay, so I told you there's an easy way to explain the difference between ontology and teleology, but there's also a slightly more difficult way to explain it, which I will try to explain easily. Now, one way of thinking about ontology versus teleology is the difference between being and becoming. The difference between being and becoming is very different when you look at Aristotle versus Plato. For Aristotle, as we said before, all becoming is simply an unspooling of the coil of being. In other words, let's say that you are a ball of wool. You simply pick a thread and you pull out that thread. That is becoming. And at a certain point, you could say you become a sweater. You have a ball of wool and the ball of wool exists to become a sweater. And if you are good at knitting this sweater, then you will become a beautiful, giant, not scratchy sweater, which is simply another way of saying that you are an acorn that will at some point become a tree. So we have a linear relationship between being and becoming for Aristotle, a linear relationship between that which you already are and that which you could become if you do it right, if you create the right environment you will maybe already know or suspect that for Plato, this is not how it works. For Plato, we are not something to begin with and we become it. For Plato, we are all fallen beings, if, as it were. For Plato, the ideal, the truth, the moment where being matches its purpose, if you will, exists in the ideal, namely in the abstract, outside the cave, what he calls capital T truth or essence. And that to be in the world is to be something which can aspire to this essence. There's almost like a spiritual component that you can see here within Plato, which starts to help you understand why Neoplatonism becomes so important for early Christianity, which is that the truth, if you will, the tree, is in essence, outside the cave. It doesn't lie within the world. And we have to aspire to become something which is as close as possible to the ideal form. And so if you will, let's juxtapose this for a moment, which is that for Aristotle, you have the acorn, which contains a blueprint or a DNA of everything that it will become. And then it slowly becomes that, it becomes the tree. For Plato, it's much more radical. For Plato, the blueprint lies within essence, namely outside the physical world in the spiritual, capital T truth. And that we are the process of the unfolding 
of that essence. Very big difference. Aristotle here is more common sense, more, if you will, scientific or empirical, which is that you have a physical property that contains a blueprint to become something else. It's a little bit like in Pokemon, right? If you train your Pokemon enough, it will evolve. If you nurture the acorn enough, it will become a tree. Plato has a much more difficult and controversial idea, which is, what if we're not the acorn? What if we're the process of becoming? What if in the unfolding of us, the acorn is actually essence or the ideal, that we are unfolding that which precipitates us, namely an essence that we cannot reach? Now again, I said this was the more difficult way of explaining it, so we can put that aside for a moment right now. Just put it aside and we can come back to it. I'm gonna take a sip of my drink. All right, so here we have an idea or a division, if you will, between an Aristotelian conception of ontology versus teleology, namely being and becoming, versus a Platonic one. And there's a great line from the German romantic poet Schlegel that we can apply to this. It's actually, it's a really great line. It's one of those lines where you read it and you think, what does it mean? And then you realize, ah. So the line from Schlegel is, one cannot be a philosopher. One can only become one. And that's, it's really interesting. Let's pack, unpack that for a moment. When Schlegel says one cannot be a philosopher, one can only become one. Well, there's a couple ways to interpret that. On the one end, you could say that every person who proclaims themselves to be a philosopher is thereby already a sophist, right? And, and again, I don't believe in this division between philosophers and sophists, but the idea that Sch Schlegel's building upon is that to declare yourself a philosopher, to say, I am the one who has the answers, is thereby precisely to no longer be a philosopher. That philosophers are not the people who go around proclaiming themselves great philosophers. But there's a more beautiful element to this as well, which is that, remember when I said that you can't inhabit your own success? That Peter Jackson can't enjoy his own movies? This is what Schlegel means, which is that you can never actually be a philosopher to yourself. You can only become one. That to be a philosopher is to be in a perpetual process of becoming, of constant questioning, of constant reformulation, of trying to tackle the problems of existence, that you're never done. There's no point where you say, okay, I am now a philosopher. I'm going to hang up my hat and go do something else. If you will, it is a way of life. It's also why to have a degree in philosophy doesn't necessarily make you a philosopher. One of the things that I try to tell people and I get DMs about this quite frequently is you don't have to go to university to study philosophy. You could literally go to a public library or download a PDF and start on the journey that it is to read and study philosophy by yourself. There's no one who wouldn't benefit from studying philosophy in some capacity because philosophy tackles some of the very preeminent questions of existence things that you probably think about already. One of the most validating things in the world is to have an idea that you've been trying to formulate or a problem that you've been trying to solve, that you intuit, and then to realize that other philosophers have thought about it as well and have sometimes created entire systems around this idea. That you feel less alone because you realize that the ideas that you have that are milling around in your brain, that the chaos that we all live is reflected in the chaos of others. And so yes, absolutely do study philosophy on your own time. You don't have to go to a university to study philosophy. In fact, you may be worse off doing so, but we can, we can talk about that in the Q&A, which we do afterwards for our patrons. Um, plug, that is www.patreon.com forward slash Jeneline and Julian, where I post a weekly Q&A after each and every lecture. So Schlegel has this idea where he says, one cannot be a philosopher, one can only become one. What he means is that to be a philosopher is to be enamored with the process of becoming. If you think about this, like the same is true for most entrepreneurs on the internet. Their point isn't to become X amount rich or to have done everything or to start one company. Most people who consider themselves entrepreneurs say, I simply like being an entrepreneur. I like the chase. I like learning new things and acquiring new skills and building new companies and meeting new people. That in a sense, you could apply the idea that Schlegel has to the idea of being an entrepreneur. You could simply say, one is never an entrepreneur, one only becomes one. That the person who is like, I have figured it out, I know everything, is the person who's already lost. That 
if you begin with the assumption that other people know more about you, that <laughs> with the assumption that other people know more than you about things that you have not yet learned about, then your learning process is never over. That education never stops. That as long as you're alive, you have the privilege and the luxury to keep improving yourself, to keep on being curious and learning new things. That if you ever reached an end point where you said, I'm satisfied, I know everything I need to know, I no longer experience curiosity, you would thereby no longer be fully in life. And so when Schlegel says that one cannot be a philosopher, one can only become one, it's a principle that can be applied to literally every other profession. Anything that you do passionately, you don't want to be it, you want to keep on becoming it. You don't want to say, this is done, I'm satisfied. You want to say, I want to remain fruitfully unsatisfied. That is what passion is. Passion isn't saying, I really want X. Passion is saying, I want the wanting itself. I've talked about this before. This is the Lacanian psychoanalytic formula of desire, which is that we don't desire the object. We desire desire itself, that we want to keep on wanting. And of course, one of the things that happens within our consumer society is that we're given all kinds of arbitrary ways to keep on wanting. Here's the latest Marvel movie. Here's the latest, I don't know, shoe brand that you have to buy. Here's the new thing. We want the new, we chase the new because the new is a reflection of that which, with, which lies within ourself, which is that we want to continuously reinvent ourselves, that the whole point of being alive is to strive and so what happens within a consumer society is that we're given a shortcut. Instead of building upon ourselves, instead of trying to be a better person or be more successful or more creative, instead of constantly trying to be better at that which we are currently failing at, in other words, becoming, we're told, buy this thing. You will have instant access to feeling better. And of course, that's empty, that's hollow. Everybody knows that as soon as you buy one thing, no matter how exciting, you want the next thing. You're never going to be done. And so what's funny is that within a consumer society, and you could say within a capitalist society, we create manufactured desire, which is a poor reflection of the natural innate desire that we experience to become our better selves. That buying an expensive piece of clothing feels like a shortcut towards becoming a better self. Now, I don't want to judge people who enjoy buying nice things. Clearly, I'm not wearing a burlo sack myself. And yet the whole point is to say that you can either choose the easy fix, which is buy into the dream, which is buying into the dream of your better self, or actually go about building a better self. This is something that Schopenhauer already understood, and Nietzsche would later develop, which is also why Nietzsche is one of the progenitors to existentialism, was that Schopenhauer said that people will always sell you the dream. They're not going to sell you a product. They're going to sell you the dream of the product. Here's a house. Here's a house that could be a multi-generational home. That's the dream. That's not the physical object of house. Home versus house has a very different connotation. Now, a really good salesman will realize that fundamentally, the ultimate dream is a better you. That you are lacking in purpose. That you are struggling with depression. That you feel like your life has run into a dead end. And so instead of selling you the dream of a home, they'll sell you the dream of a better you. A better you and a happier you in a home that is sold to you as a house. And Schopenhauer, and this is before capitalism even existed, Schopenhauer said, everybody will try to sell you the dream and the ultimate dream is you. Now, once you realize, you realize why would you have to pay somebody else to sell you something that will make you dream again? Why not begin dreaming in yourself right now? Why not start learning and educating and tackling something that you have not yet learned? Acquiring skills is simply the process of becoming an action. And the process of becoming an action is how we access our true being. That's the philosophical proposition, that there is no being without becoming, that it is within becoming that we find our true being. And once you realize that, a lot of other things that seem difficult in philosophy become a lot easier. Like Hegel, Hegel has this idea. One of Hegel's aphorisms is that becoming is the truth of being. And Hegel is like known as one of the most difficult abstract, inscrutable, idealist thinkers. And yet, if you understand that line, it's actually quite intuitive. Becoming is the truth of being. Oh yeah, we can't be. We can't fully inhabit our own being. Like, think about it, just sit for a moment and try to just be. It's almost fundamentally impossible for us as human beings. We are coded to be restless. 
And this restlessness is what drives our curiosity. It drives both our worst impulses and our best. And that this problem, which is the inaccessible, untraversable horizon of being, leads to our very becoming. And to go back to the difference between Aristotle and Plato, remember we talked about ontology versus teleology. If ontology is being and teleology is becoming, namely finding something which is your purpose, essentially, now we can take Hegel's proposition and Schlegel's proposition and read it very differently. Remember, Schlegel says one cannot be a philosopher, one can only become one. Hegel takes this German romantic idea and pushes it to its logical extreme, which, by the way, side note, is what Hegel does all the time. Hegel is the ultimate German idealist because he simply takes what appears to be an aphorism or a truism within German romanticism, like one cannot be a philosopher, one can only become one. He takes this witticism and then he actually turns it into an entirely profound philosophical system that has huge ramifications upon what then becomes the history of Western thought. You cannot understand Marx without understanding Hegel, but that's for the rest of this series. So the teleological proposition, namely what is the purpose of something versus the ontological proposition, what is the nature of its being, thereby becomes conflated for Hegel. And now you realize that Hegel's entire ontology, namely what is something, simply becomes what is something's purpose. That instead of saying something begins as being, a glob of potential, and then unfolds its purpose into its true nature, the acorn becoming the tree, Instead, Hegel creates a dialectical system, a dialectical system being one in which we have a mutual exchange between these two seemingly opposite poles. Namely, that the truth of being is becoming. That being is simply the other side of the coin of becoming. That there is no being on sich or on priori until it is manifested in becoming. Let me give you an example of this um, that's hopefully a little bit more relatable. You know this truism from even like you've probably heard this on TV or on the internet, which is that there is no right time to do something. Like there's no right time to have children. There's no right time to start writing your book. There's no right time to start making a movie. There's never gonna be a moment, or perhaps very rarely is there gonna be a moment in which you receive a sign from the heavens that says, this is where you start. And this is like, existentially so devastating, which is that we grow up thinking that we're all at the starting line and that at a certain point we're gonna hear the gun go off and it's like we all run. And yet then you realize that you're already halfway or a quarter way through your life and it's like you feel like the race has already started but you never got started. And this feeling is at the heart of what a lot of people experience as depression, which isn't to say that depression isn't a clinical biological reality where you have something that is misfiring in your brain, not to stigmatize it, but simply when it comes to the way in which you create serotonin, etc. that part of depression is simply feeling like there's a disconnect between your being and your becoming. That you do not have future perspective, that you do not have something that you look forward to that animates you or makes you happy, that you feel fundamentally out of joint within your own timeline, within your own narrative. And there's something very, to me, there's something very profound about what Hegel says, which is that there is no right time where being turns into becoming. And the platitude that you've probably seen on the internet is simply to say, well, if there is no right moment, then the right moment is now. And of course, I believe this, right? The right moment is right now. If you wanna do something, you might as well have started yesterday. If you wanna be a great athlete, start training today. If you want to be a writer, start writing today. Like, nothing is ever wasted. You can go through years trying to do something, as long as you're trying it every day, you're gonna be fine. If you keep, like, what is the requirement to become a writer? It's reading a lot of books. It's doing a lot of writing. What is the requirement to, I don't know, climbing a mountain or going to Mount Everest? It's training a lot of, on other mountains. Like, it's a very simple proposition, which is that if you wanna do something great, you have to start by doing something small, but you have to do it greatly. And that whatever you're doing small, you have to do with the determination as if you were doing something great. That this is exactly what grace is. Grace isn't saying, oh, I won't be bothered unless it's an act of epic proportions. It's to say that the, the attitude of doing something epic has to be applied to doing something very small. That it's not the magnitude of the task that should determine the manner of your intensity. That you should work just as intensely on sucking as you should someday at succeeding. Now this, what is essentially a truism, but I believe very much to be true, obviously, that there is no right moment, that you have to make your own right moment. This is 
what Hegel is arguing as well, except in a more philosophical manner. Hegel is simply saying, becoming is the truth of being. Now, if you think about that through the lens of there is no right moment, it's there is no moment, there's no one moment in which the conditions are perfect for you to start. It's never, like if you're waiting for a moment where everything, the stars are gonna align, it's not gonna come. That the only way in which the right moment comes is by realizing that it's never gonna come. And now you realize like, this is kind of like an important argument, which is that, wait, there is a right moment. The right moment is the exact moment that you realize that there is no right moment. That's essentially Hegel's argument here, which is to say, once you realize that there is no right moment to start, you've already started. Like this realization that there is no neutral a priori starting point is the starting point. And now of course you could say, wow, this is pseudo profound. And yes, on that level, it's not particularly profound. Yet what Hegel is making here is an argument about ontology and teleology. Hegel is refuting the Aristotelian idea of the acorn becoming the tree. Instead of an acorn existing to begin with that finds its perfect conditions and then becomes a tree, Hegel is arguing that only once it is a tree will it realize that it was an acorn. Now you hear that and it doesn't, doesn't make sense. That seems like, wow, that makes no sense at all, which is often true for Hegel. And yet let me explain why it does. So Slavoj Žižek has a really interesting way of explaining this, which we can relate to the Nietzschean idea of freedom. Žižek says, imagine a situation in which somebody on the street is, I don't know, they, they, they fall over, they faint, and you rush over and you call an ambulance, right? Here we have a quote unquote heroic act. Everybody just pretended like nothing happened. Somebody fell over on the street. Everybody went about their day and you were the one who ran over and called 911 or whatever that number is in your country. Now, if the journalist, if a TV journalist showed up and interviewed this hero, the selfless hero, and said, what made you do it? Why did you choose to act when, when nobody else did? Then the most likely response would be, I didn't have a choice. Of course I had to act. I mean, look at the situation. Somebody dropped over in the middle of the street. Of course I had to act. And yet nobody else did. Everybody else just walked away. And Zizek says that this is the definition of true freedom. Not, I have the freedom to do anything, but precisely, I had no choice but to act. That is true freedom. And this paradox, which goes back to the Kantian imperative, du kannst denn du sollst, you can because you must, is at the heart of the idea of freedom and the right moment. Think about it. If for Zizek, the ultimate definition of freedom is, I did it because I had to, I had no choice, then the same thing is true for Hegel. Once you realize that there is no right moment to start, then you realize that you have to start. That the only right moment is the one of your own making. In other words, your own freedom isn't a priori. It's not, I am free to do anything and therefore I act. I'm waiting for the starting sign. Instead, it's almost the exact opposite. There is no starting point. I am not free. There will never be a moment in which I know what to do with myself. And because I know this, I am now free to act. I am free because I have to be free because nobody else is gonna be free for me. That's what's funny about freedom is that we think about freedom as an absolute, as in I could do anything. And that's not exactly what freedom is. Freedom is almost the exact opposite, namely, I can't do everything, but I'm going to find something that I am going to do, that I have to do, that is an inner necessity, what we also call purpose. And this is why Zizek says that the person who rescues someone, like if you selflessly jump into a lake and rescue somebody from drowning, this is the ultimate act of free agency. Except it doesn't appear to you as if you chose it, it appeared to you as if you acted from necessity. And that's how you start. That is how you start a project. That's how you overcome the proficiency gap. It's not to say, I'm going to wait until I'm good. I'm going to wait until the conditions are perfect. It's saying, oh, wait, I'm not going to be good unless I start. The conditions are never going to be perfect unless I start making them so. 
that you are not the passive agent of change, you are the active agent of your own becoming. And now you can understand some of the limitations within the Aristotelian idea that Plato would reject. Namely, if you are simply an acorn that becomes a tree, then this require, the, implies a kind of linear determinism, which is, I am X, and I, in the right environment, will thrive into becoming the next level, evolution. And yet what Hegel is arguing, which is thereby closer to Platonic idealism, is that you never act autonomously, freely. Growth and development isn't linear, it's not a forward trajectory. Instead, the very idea of freedom emerges almost too late, retroactively. I was free because in that moment I realized that I had to be free. Now, if you think about it, that's not free, that's forced. And so for Hegel, freedom is forced. You have to force your own freedom. It doesn't happen to you. And that freedom is there by the paradox which mirrors the paradox of humanity itself, which is that we don't enjoy being, we enjoy becoming which is another way of saying that we don't enjoy succeeding, we enjoy failing. And that once you realize that you enjoy failing, you have thereby started to actualize your success. The same is true for Hegel when it comes to an ontological proposition, which is that it's not that we have an ontology, we have a being that has to find its true nature. It's that our true nature is to have to make our own being. That there is no being to begin with. It emerges within becoming itself. That your truth isn't like, imagine this, like a sorting hat in Harry Potter, where you put the hat on it, it says, you're Gryffindor, a Slytherin. That's not how it works for Hegel. It's not saying this was already within you and you found your true nature. It's almost the exact opposite. It's saying you found your true nature because you resisted it every day. And that's exactly what it means to thrive. It's to say, I will enjoy the fruitful pursuit of resisting my own self resisting my urges in my inner nature. Everybody knows this. This is a truism that if you want to be successful in any creative endeavor or any professional endeavor, it starts by putting aside the things that you would like to do on behalf of the things that you would like at some day to be able to. That you have to be able to delineate your time and have priorities. That if you're simply going out all the time and doing other things, you won't have the time to study or you won't have the time to make the right investments or you won't have the time to, I don't know, work on your training, all those things. That it starts with limiting yourself. That freedom is thereby exactly the process of saying, I have the freedom not to do things. Freedom isn't I couldn't do everything. Freedom is I know exactly what it is I want to do and thereby I am not going to do X amount of other things. That freedom isn't absolute in that sense. That the ultimate way in which you enact your freedom is through self-discipline. And then you realize, wait, self-discipline is simply making yourself unfree. That the way in which freedom emerges for yourself is by saying, I will make myself less free. Less free to do other things. Less free to go out with friends. Which isn't to say that you shouldn't enjoy life, but it's saying that discipline and self-discipline is at the heart of becoming. Because if you're not applying yourself, then you're not getting better. You're simply being. And here we realize how for Hegel, there is no truth in being. We become sad when we're in being. When we're simply letting time flow through us, we feel somehow like we're lacking in purpose. And one of the painful things is that when it comes to consumption or even video games, which I'm not against video games at all. I love video games. But like, there are many things that provide pseudo activity or pseudo becoming that we feel like we're leveling up, and yet we're simply stuck in being. And what makes us happy and content isn't being, it's becoming. And Hegel's philosophical, much more difficult argument is thereby that being doesn't really exist. There is no being. There is only becoming. And that once you realize that, then the truth of becoming is being, namely that the nature and the truth of your being is precisely becoming. That becoming is not the opposite of being. That becoming is how you unlock your true being. And that's the argument that Hegel makes, apropos being and becoming. Now, if we take that back to summarize, to get to the end, if we take that back to the idea of freedom and theory and practice, remember, I started with the idea of the proficiency gap. The proficiency gap is simply the gap that you experience when you're trying to do something and you realize that there is a massive gap between what you are able to do and what you would like to do. If I get on a skateboard right now, 
there is a very large gap between me being able to be on the skateboard and me being Tony Hawk. And yet, the willingness to overcome that gap, to persist and incrementally make that gap smaller, where you surprise yourself and you do something which you couldn't have imagined doing, namely becoming, is precisely the truth of your being. That you unlock the secret and the key to your existence by means of doing that which you do not know yet how to do well. That the proficiency gap grows smaller and smaller the better you become and the more you persist. And that thereby the test of character is precisely to say that I am willing to accept that I suck. And it is not that I will go from sucking to not sucking, but every single day I will suck a little bit less until I have it down. And there's something beautiful when it comes to learning a new skill, which is that suddenly it clicks. And suddenly you can't even imagine not knowing how to do it. You learn a new language or you can play an instrument and you can't even imagine what it was like not to know how to do that thing. Because now you are it. Now you are a musician. Now you are a skateboarder or a writer or whatever. That once you acquire a skill, you thereby become the thing. And that's when you realize that you never stop learning. That's when you realize Schlegel's maxim, that you are never a philosopher, you are always becoming one. That the thing that you now can do, the skill that you've unlocked, playing an instrument, writing a book, skateboarding, whatever, the skill that you've unlocked is now a perpetual process. Then you realize, oh, even Tony Hawk is never satisfied, always trying to learn another trick. Even Peter Jackson is trying to make what he hopes will someday be a better movie, etc. That this process of becoming thereby becomes your truth. And that is a profound gift to realize that, that the people that you thought had it figured out are simply the people who enjoy getting up every morning and trying to fail a little bit more at that which they are trying to accomplish. That that is the truth of existence. And finally, we link that to a philosophical premise, which is that the division within Western philosophy, and we can talk more about this next week, between essence and appearance, between the world of the ideal, the world of the ideal form, the truth outside the cave, and the world of appearances, of objects, of subjectivity in the world, this seeming binary, is thereby reflected within the debate when it comes to theory and practice. Between theory being the abstract idea of something and practice being the actual doing of it, which is also thereby a philosophical proposition about the relationship between ontology, the abstract nature of being, and teleology, namely the unfolding of purpose and something's true nature. And then once you realize that, you realize that this is fundamentally and profoundly a proposition about freedom. That freedom isn't the power to do everything, Freedom is precisely the power to feel like you had no choice. That self-discipline is not giving yourself another option. This has to be done. And then you realize that the right moment to start with something will never arrive until you realize that it will never arrive, and thereby the right moment has arrived. That something always emerges precisely in its opposite nature. And thereby we have the Hegelian dialectical proposition, namely that being is the truth of becoming. That once you reject the idea of being on sich and you embrace becoming, you have unlocked the secret of being. That is the entire lecture. Thank you guys so much for watching. I appreciate you very, very much. Um, if you'd like to keep watching these lectures, if you'd like to download every single one of them, I would very much appreciate it if you took a look at my Patreon. That's www.patreon.com forward slash Jenaline and Julian. You can also find this in the link in bio, both on YouTube and on Instagram. I'm gonna be teaching this lecture series every single morning, Monday morning, so if you're looking for an inspiring intellectual boost to your week, please head over to my Patreon where you can download the entire series. Plus, that allows me to keep on doing this and I am ever so grateful. A huge thank you to all of our patrons. A huge thank you to everybody who has joined us this morning. I hope you have a wonderful week and I will see you next Monday. Thanks guys, bye-bye.